All right. Hello and welcome to Real Talk Office Hours, Hunting for Silver Linings for this Wednesday, July 22nd, 2020. Hosted today by Corey Hart, myself, and George Gazanos. And we're brought to you by Startup Grind, the world's largest startup community. We have 600 plus chapters in over 125 countries, and we operate with a mission to educate, inspire, and connect. This pandemic has been and will continue to be the great global leveler. And as entrepreneurs, we do our very best for our businesses, teams, and families, and we need to be informed, rational, analytical, and rigorous in our thinking. We should also learn to control our biases as they emerge in various circumstances. Now, we do invite everyone to join us live every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as we record these episodes and track the intersection of facts, biases, and action through our review of global financial markets, alongside check-ins and real talk with Startup Grind chapter directors, entrepreneurs, and ecosystem stakeholders from across the world. Now, no one has a crystal ball, but if we keep our eyes and ears open and pay attention, we may be able to see around the bend and with some luck, spot the silver linings that are around every cloud. If you miss the live events, you can view the recordings at startupgrind.com slash grand dash rapids. And now before I introduce George for the global market update, there's a bit of housekeeping. The comments made and views expressed by all participants in this podcast are not intended to invite or incite individuals, entrepreneurs, or investors to buy or sell financial assets, real assets, commodities, futures, and or options. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform not to trade or to invest. If you feel compelled to trade and or invest, please call your broker. Remember, however, risk is everywhere, even when you think you're not taking a risk. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce George to get us started with the, uh, the catch up what the markets are doing. Hello, Corey, um, and uh, hello to all our participants. Um, we have had a marathon meeting in Brussels last week that ended in an agreement one of the probably defining agreements of the European Union. The package of 750 billion euros was um, finalized and um, Mrs. Merkel said, um, Ich bin erleichtert. In English that means I am, um, I'm feeling lighter, I'm feeling relieved. Um, that is not a good outcome um, and the economists captured the move um, very interesting by saying that the EU's 750 billion plan is historic, but not quite Hamiltonian. Um, obviously, the European markets were expecting um, uh, some form of agreement, and that's why they rallied last week. Uh, they rallied at the beginning of this week. Uh, but let's uh, start from the beginning. As we always uh, say, um, the currency markets is the first place to look for change. And um, guess what? Risk on is on. The trade is to sell the, U the dollar and buy any other currency because money is flowing out of the US looking for more investment opportunities, especially in countries that have been historically either on a downward path uh, or because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, their economies showed significant dislocation. So first and foremost, Euro. Money is going back to Europe. Um, the US-Japan trade is remaining steady at about 107. The Bank of Japan does not want to have a stronger yen and it seems they're doing their best. Um, on the other hand, sterling. Sterling is growing stronger by the day. Who would have thought? 127. The Aussie dollar, again, stronger at uh, 0 0.71. The Canadian dollar, slightly stronger, 1.34. Across the board, we're beginning to see that the investors' appetite for riskier assets has increased. However, when we look into the bond markets, what we are not seeing a major sell-off. On the contrary, um, as we said on Monday, the 10-year bonds around the globe are telling us, be cautious, don't get fooled. We investors who are conservative, who care more about the return of our capital, we still see the 10-year bond markets around the world as being a relative safe haven. Now, we should also bear in mind that these interest rates that we see here are not necessarily reflective of supply and demand. In other words, we know that the governments have been massaging interest rates. They've been supplying a lot of money They've been issuing a lot of bonds, so each one of the markets is flush with cash, and the central banks are targeting specific maturities. We know Japan did it, started doing that in 2015. Australia de facto did it in May of this year. 
and a whole range of other countries are beginning to follow the path. Why? Because that way they cannot control the expense of issuing money. In Europe, on the other hand, we have seen a wonderful little rally in fixed income. Germany at negative 0.5%. Switzerland, negative 0.53%. This is 10-year bonds. It's not overnight lending, by the way. I want to remind everyone who's listening that the European market is flush with cash and investors have not gone massively into all kinds of different investments. Investors still prefer the security of their capital. That's why we have negative interest rates in these markets. On the other hand, laggards like Italy, Greece, Spain, Portugal have done very, very well, thank you. Greece at 1.1% for 10 years. Italy, 1.04%, nearly 1%, unprecedented. Spain, 0.3%, Portugal, 0.3%. Again, European bond markets are telling us a similar story. It may not be an exaggeration to say that the agreement on Monday was pivotal in saving Europe and the Euro, and in a sense, the vision still goes on. But as the economy suggested, it was not quite Hamiltonian. So doubts remain. Here on, uh, in the Americas, we always look at four markets, the US, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico, because we capture the high yields and the, uh, so to speak, stalwarts. The US is trading under 0.6 a rally in the bond market. Canada, again, 0.5. Brazil, 6.5%. Mexico, under 5.8. What are the bond markets are telling us? They're not convinced. All this chit-chat about uh, stimulus, all this uh, chit-chat about um, more um, financial engineering and so on and so forth, at the government level, of course, funding companies, funding municipalities, funding sovereigns, and so on and so forth, is beginning to be in people's minds. Why do we say this? Because gold is flirting with 2000. Believe it or not, the two considerations that we have uh, as investors are safety of our principal and return of our principal, right? When we invest somewhere, we want to get our money back. Well, um, the governments are doing their best to increase the supply of money as an antidote to deflationary pressures, quite rightly. This is traditional, what we call Keynesian policy. And it seems to have worked. In the meantime, however, there are those who believe that there could be inflationary pressures down the road, like Jeremy Siegel. Uh, what does that mean? You need to find an asset that holds its value relative to debased currencies. And this has historically been gold. So we shouldn't be surprised to see gold at 2000 and above 2000 soon. In fact, Citibank issued a report a few days ago suggesting that uh, we could see gold going higher, significantly higher. Copper, on the other hand, is flirting with 300. And we said that copper is a reflection of manufacturing demand and wealth of the manufacturing sector throughout the globe. Copper is an industrial metal and it's used in numerous applications. So the advance of copper from under $200, under $200 uh, a pound back in March to $300 now suggests that manufacturing has picked up. The question, however, is this. Is this pickup in manufacturing activity a reflection of supply and demand, or is it government intervention? And I would like to remind everybody that last week the Chinese government intervened to buy, to protect Chinese insurers. The insurance industry in China is soon facing its Lehman Brothers moment. And this is something the markets are paying attention to, are listening to. On the agricultural front, we see that uh, the grains um, are modestly up this morning. The idea is that, um, well, maybe um, there will be some light at the end of the tunnel. However, as you have noted uh, everywhere in the news, uh, that um, the US decided to close the Chinese consulate in Houston. So uh, tit for tat, we are in a pre-election uh, campaign mode. Everything is probable and possible. Hold on to your letter, Hosen. Let's finalize this review of the uh, 
commodities market by looking at the energies. West Texas Intermediate, over $41. Well, you're surprised as much as I am, I assume. The reason is that uh, clearly um, considerations of short-term nature about supply and demand, about the reserve use um, here in the US and elsewhere are suggesting that um, the um, economy is heading higher, the demand for oil globally is improving, and uh, therefore, as long as uh, China, uh, sorry, as uh, OPEC and Russia stick to their um, production cuts, oil is heading higher. The same considerations apply to Brent. Finally, natural gas, 1.66. Again, nothing major here to report, except overall, the commodities markets are suggesting caution in case of um, gold because of the basement of the currency and because of uh, safe haven considerations for the investors. The grains are suggesting, uh, please be careful, unless we have major agreements with China, the prices are going to remain soft. And um, industrial metals are saying, things seem to be good for the moment, but uh, uh, look elsewhere for clues, including the bond market. Finally, let's close by a look of the universe of uh, asset classes by looking into Asia and equities. India was higher, Pakistan was higher um, this morning in Asia. China marginally higher. Um, Taiwan was down, Korea was down, only marginally, no big moves. Heading uh, um, into a um, strange period of announcements uh, in US equities. As you know, we have a lot of news. Tesla, among others, is reporting today, so it's going to be interesting to see what Elon Musk and co. have to report. On the European side, um, we've seen some profit taking. You can see red throughout Europe. It is not surprising after the massive rally of the last uh, few days. The key question is, um, ultimately, will there be a trickle-down effect, a democratic, principled, consistent trickle-down effect between the center of Europe and the periphery. And this has been the key question since the conception and since the inception of Europe. You may recall that uh, in 1992, in 1993, we had the European exchange rate mechanism and it was the time when Soros took advantage of the overvaluation of sterling to manage its exit. Similar pressures, high pressures, are inevitable in these kinds of political arrangements. Unless the economic socialization, the economic inclusion is consistent, then the compact becomes brittle. Thank you so much, Corey. Back to you now. Thanks, George. Uh, wondering for, uh, for our listeners, if you could um, in regards to the European stimulus package, what does it mean not Hamiltonian? What does it mean? Yeah. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, what does it mean, the, the term not Hamiltonian? Yes. Um, if you remember, Hamilton um, was influential in consolidating the United States as a country in his thinking, in his actions, in his encouragement of integration. In Europe, the problem has been that periphery countries like Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece have hidden behind successive devaluations of the currencies prior to joining the euro in an effort to cover systemic imbalances. And the most important was consumption against revenue. In other words, these, um, the soft underbelly of Europe, including France, have always had budget deficits, which they funded through, of course, bond issuance, but occasionally through letting the currencies depreciate against more productive countries, for instance, like Germany. So when the euro came, the idea was the convergence would take place, namely that countries like Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, France, and a few other high spending countries would, um, through policy constraints, would facilitate a convergence. What were these constraints? reduced government spending, opening the labor markets, making the financial sector more efficient, making production more efficient, developing new technologies, and so on and so forth, including the digitalization of the economy. Well, uh, some of the larger countries, like France, like um, uh, Spain, for instance, 
did well out of the 2008-2009 crisis in the sense that they managed to recover, they consolidated the banking sector, they um, rebuilt the economic infrastructure. Less so in Portugal and Greece. Italy has been a chronic problem. Chronic because of corruption, chronic because of the unwillingness of the political elite to make tough decisions. As we have spoken before, if you draw a line in GDP between 1990 and 2020, the average GDP growth is whatever it is, but the collective has been zero. In other words, between 1990 and 2020, GDP has grown by zero in Italy. So you're talking about 30 years of no growth, of no substantial growth. The reasons for that are lack of competitors, competitiveness, lack of fiscal prudential supervision, and lack of cleaning up of the banking sector. So in a sense, I'm not surprised that Holland, Austria, and a few of the other smaller countries are complaining uh, about the package, namely the fact that it's too, too generous and too dangerous for the union. On the other hand, we have seen that, especially after 2010, countries like Greece, Portugal, Italy, Spain have taken the pain of readjusting their economies. Now, the big question is this, are those in power today able to guarantee that for the next 10 years, the decisions are going to be consistent with the decisions that are made today? In other words, that the leadership that will follow Merkel, that will follow um, the French uh, leadership, the Portuguese leadership, the Italian leadership, the Greek leadership are going to follow the same principles. Because let's be very clear about it. You don't get out of a hole called COVID-19 overnight. It will take more than five years to stabilize the economy and definitely another five years to grow. So all these forecasts about, oh, we will reach 2019 levels of GDP in two years or three years, in my mind, simplistically thinking, are bogus. So it will take consistent and concerted effort for Europe to recover its mojo, if you want to call it, or competition, the ability to withstand pressures, and the ability to make decisions collectively. Until now, and we saw that very clearly, 2008, 2009, each country bore its own responsibility for fixing the banking system. In fact, Germany and the Bundesbank insisted that the ECB did not participate in bond buying, did not participate in helping the banking system. And you may remember that in 2009, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, many people out of Bundesbank were complaining about profligate spending in the South. And they were unwilling to help the consolidation of European interests. So again, this background, which is both political and economic, you have decisions that essentially suggest that slowly Europe is um, creating a coordinating approach to this crisis. We're beginning, however, to see, and I mentioned that on, on uh, Monday, we're beginning to see that it is becoming acceptable to invest directly in companies in Europe. So there is a moral hazard here. Who is selecting the beneficiaries of this new investment? What are the criteria for entering this investment? Who will be monitoring this investment? How will governments exit these investments? So are we using public money for personal aggrandizement and supporting of the ruling elite? Or are we really taking a um, market approach that we're trying to find winners and support them? It seems that by advocating investment in green Europe, the 750 billion package tends to address the issue of the 21st century. It tends to address the issue of innovation and the issue of a new labor force. In practice, however, it takes a long time. So um, I'm uh, holding my breath. Right. And, uh... And as the other regions of the of the world uh, uh, look on and try to uh, take take lessons and follow some sort of some sort of lead or, or direction, now we have uh, the U.S. Uh, coming up with uh, with their next round. Um, 
and uh, and we're going to figure out what that is in the next few weeks. So well, other things. Talking about the next round very quickly. Uh, one of mm-hmm. the reasons the dollar is trading at one sixteen is because um, uh, the Senate is talking about another trillion dollars worth of spending. So um, if you remember, we talked about the IMF report that was issued this last Thursday, uh, a week ago. Um, and they mentioned that uh, other things being equal as we stand without any more stimulus money. By 2030, the debt to GDP ratio in the US is gonna be 160%. So with an aging population, uh, 160% uh, to GDP debt to GDP ratio is astonishing. It is astonishing. It is astonishing that the dollar is 116 against the euro and 125. It is astonishing that the bond market is trading in 0.55, the 10 year, and not with 1% in front of it, right? So there is a lot of um, parts here in in this um, uh, conundrum that are being managed very carefully by the Federal Reserve and US Treasury, but um, we have to be very careful. A stop-go economy is not a consistently growing economy. No, and uh, it's a it's a stop go planet right now. So that's uh, uh, and we've always we've always talked about how we have to be cautious. Uh, caution is the uh, is the is the, has been our word. <laughs> of, well, of all of them. yes, and, and you remember the reason we do the market update is because we address questions that we receive from our universe of entrepreneurs and investors globally, and the best so to speak, information we get is by gauging the markets daily. By gauging the markets, we see what the markets are thinking. And the thinking is complex. The thinking is non-linear. The thinking is a combination of resources to current events. So whatever triggers volatility is news. And the market every day tries to assimilate the news and come up with potential outcomes. In, in effect, the market is a discounting mechanism of future outcomes. And that's what we're seeing every day. Yeah. And uh, so also, do you have, um, uh, like we just saw some news about uh, the, the this agreement with the United States and uh, a vaccine uh, producer where uh, the, the U.S. is anticipating to have up to access to up to uh, 500 uh, million doses of this, uh, this vaccine. And, uh, and that is, uh, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of hopeful news also. So um, is there, and with the different vaccines being uh, developed across the world, mo- mostly between Europe and the US, is there, is there any kind of uh, odd concerns or runs on, on opportunity there? Um. Allow me to be skeptical for a moment because human nature is uh, fickle. We have had uh, measles, we have the vaccine against measles and people do not take the vaccine. It's not because it's expensive, it's not because um, inaccessible or whatever, Sim- simply people don't want to take vaccines. So even with a vaccine that generates in the Western world or in China or somewhere in Asia or Japan, there will always be this virus with us and we have to live with it we have to really turn our thinking around that a vaccine doesn't mean the eradication of this virus Mm -hmm. that's the first point the second point is that even with vaccine accessible it will take time for all of us to actually use this vaccine regularly because this is not going to be a one-off the research that i've seen so far suggests that Taking the vaccine once doesn't mean that you not need to take it again and again and again. So this is an iteration process that will involve a lot of education, educating the public, a lot of time by the CDC coming down to the level of the individual citizen, the individual person, and informing them about what it means to be protected, why to take the vaccine is important. And also the um, second level effect of if you don't take the vaccine, what happens to the rest of the people around you, including your colleagues at work, your fellow students at the university, your fellow pupils at uh, high school or the primary school, kindergarten, and so on and so forth. All right, and also the vaccine isn't, uh, like as you, as you started to say, isn't a short-term solution. It, and it, we, we, we have a history of, uh, of inoculating, inoculation and vaccines and uh, takes a decade or more 
to successfully affect the population of the, of the planet. Corey, um, I will never forget the speech that um, Bill Gates gave in April of 2015, where he warned the world about pandemics. What is really happening is that we've seen a callous approach by all governments from east to west. Start going from the first country in the east and roll the, the globe to the west. No country responded responsibly, except maybe Singapore, maybe Korea, who knows. But most countries were completely either taken aback or unprepared or unwilling to accept the reality of it. So if this pandemic is a good indicator of what happens when we have the next pandemic, then my goodness, we are lamb to slaughter. Right, and, uh, and because it does take so long, a uh, decade or more, to, to successfully get the planet together on this, uh, we, we're already talking about uh, handling two pandemics at once. <laughs> so. Yes, yes. I think um, come November, December, here in the Northern Hemisphere, where we're located, uh, it will be interesting to see how the combination of the flu with um, the virus affects our health service, our, ourselves individually, and how we as a society respond to this new challenge. The fact that hospitals are bleeding, hospitals are losing money, the healthcare system uh, as it is in, in North America is very weak, is not a good omen. Right, and, uh, and we, we keep on talking about globalization of ideas and globalization of uh, the flow of, of uh, money and investment, um, public health on a global level uh, the reason why it is so fragmented and siloed is is we're seeing the results of that right now. Um, and so hopefully we'll see some more coordination in that effect because uh, public health is a global concern. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you so much for the, uh, for the update today, George. Um, any uh, final thoughts before we sign off and look forward to Friday? Yes. Yes. There's um, one point that I would like to suggest here. Um, and I think, um, we should actually try to have our friends and um, uh, acquaintances become aware of this. The, um, there's an article in Bloomberg that suggests that bond traders aim to separate distress from doom. We will see a lot of distress ahead of us. Around the world has been a lot of doom and gloom because of religious beliefs, because of social issues, lack of education, lack of a trickle-down economy, and so on and so forth. The disequilibria, the multiple disequilibria that we see around us, particularly regarding social care, health care, education, and social participation and integration. In other words, the huge discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots is culminating in a series of events or decisions that remind me very much of what um, Jared Diamond said in his book about guns, germs, and steel, that the ruling elites make conscientious decisions about whether they want to survive or to perish. And I think uh, we need to start thinking very seriously about the role of the social edifice that we have created around us. Thank you very much, Corey. Thank you, George. And uh, for everyone, we'll be here again on Friday. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we do this at uh, 10 a.m. Um, Eastern. And uh, until then, um, have a great weekend. And thanks so much for joining us.